Well, uh, I'm Pastor TJ, and uh, if we've not met, I'd love to meet you after the service and um, pray for you however I can. Uh, pastors are always available uh, after the service. Now, um, before we get to our text in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, I want to uh, celebrate our live recording from Wednesday night. We just believe in celebrating wins around here uh, as a way of glorifying God. So we came in on Wednesday night. I think uh, most of us, you know, feeling kind of just blah. It's Wednesday night. And um, we left just floating on the grace of God. And we recorded an album in the process. By we, I mean, you know, mainly the band and all of us sang along. But it was amazing. Um, it's going to be out sometime in the spring, maybe. I don't know, 2024, 2025, who knows. Um, but it was a joy. Singing is like a, it's like a side door into our souls, and it gets around a lot of other stuff, and somehow the gospel finds its way in quicker and uh, in a more explosive way than it can otherwise, and I think that's what we all experience. So if you weren't there, uh, you'll get a chance to have a taste of it, uh, hopefully, this coming spring. Now, uh, the second thing is this. Uh, we have so much to talk about around here, we just struggle to fit it all in. And one of the things that you might not know about if, you've, if you're new or newish to Emmanuel is that we have a 10th generation uh, campaign that's going on. Campaign is in a military campaign, not an election, because who gets excited about that? Um, and we need a long-term home in the city. In three and a half years, uh, we won't be able to meet here anymore. And uh, we are looking to find a, a street corner to lift up a loud voice for Jesus. In the book of Proverbs... Uh, lady Wisdom um, is uh, w wisdom is personified as a woman. I read into that what you will, men. And Lady Wisdom lifts up her voice, which is to say she preaches from the busiest street corner that she can find in the marketplace. So she goes where the people are, where Many people can hear her, and she lifts up her voice. That's what we want to do for Jesus. That's what every Jesus preaching church is trying to do. Um, so where are we going to be in Nashville? I have no idea. The busiest, you know, most people-packed place that we can afford or that God sends. Um, you'll see that we have a goal of raising $6 million um, by uh, May of 25. And I don't know, we have no idea if $6 million, what that's really going to do for us. We just know we need to get a start. And Nashville is super expensive, uh, as you all know. So that's the plan. But we here at Emmanuel love, um, we depend upon God coming through for us. I heard recently of a church in town whose um, who's just missional giving budget is more than our entire budget. And that's amazing. Praise God. Um, we're not a wealthy church. We're okay with that. We are, um, we like being in the place that A.W. Tozer called God or total collapse. So that's, that's the goal. Uh, if you want to get in on that, um, if anybody knows Bill Gates who wants to write a check for that, you know, we're not opposed to that. Um, it'll just change maybe where we end up. Now, our text, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved 
and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. This is God's word. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we pray now that you would enliven us through your living word. I pray especially for that one or few people who feel as if the word wrath is emboldened in the text and the rich grace and great love is thin. Would you reverse that? And would you free us all up by your grace to receive your love again? Or maybe for the first time. In the holy name of Christ we pray. Amen. The Apostle Paul begins this letter, um, or this chapter in Ephesians, with uh, what one commentator calls a dismal rehearsal of human failure. A dismal rehearsal of human failure. Uh, I sure, I'm sure that it felt that way as we were reading through it. You were dead, he says. You are following the prince of the power of the air. If you want to insult a modern American, tell them they're a follower. If you really want to insult them, tell them they're a follower of the devil. <laughs> um, if that's not a dismal rehearsal of human failure, I don't know what is. Uh, but the point I want to stress as we begin is that the emphasis of this passage is not on the dismal rehearsal of human failure, but on the glorious interceding of God. Verses 1 to 7 are one long sentence in the Greek text. And what's interesting about that is that the main subject and verb phrase don't actually come in until verses four and five. You see them there in those words, but God, and then in that phrase, made us alive together with Christ. So verses one to three, in other words, are setting up the arrival of the significance or they're setting the stage for the entrance of the point um, we do this still today uh, when we want to uh, highlight some um, remarkable thing. When I was a kid, I memorized a poem called Casey at the Bat for an oratory competition. And uh, I know what you're thinking. They have those in Alabama? Yes. <laughs> they do. And um, like all good baseball poems, Casey at the Bat begins with uh, a gloomy uh, setting. It says, the outlook was brilliant for the Mudville Nine that day. The score stood four to two with but one inning more to play. And then when Cooney died at first and Barrows did the same, a pall-like silence fell upon the patrons of the game. I could give you a thousand examples of that type of thing because we do it all the time. We set the stage for the turn by showing how bleak it was because we all know that uh, you know, nobody writes a poem if Casey steps up to the bat and homers with no outs in a nine-run lead. Uh, we need to see the glorious against the backdrop of the perilous to understand something of the significance of the glory. And that's the point I want to stress as we begin. We all want to be in and to inhabit and to enjoy the rich mercy of God and the great love of God. I've never talked with someone about uh, the great love of God and had them object to the idea of a merciful God or a God rich in mercy. That's not the part of the gospel we tend to object to. It's verses one to three that are hard for us to swallow. But the only way into the glory of verses uh, four and five and, and six is through the dismal rehearsal of human failure in verses one to three. So we need to lean into this. This too is gospel. So I wanna spend a little time now on verses one to three, and then I'll conclude by looking at the resolve of verses four and five. So number one, I packaged it all together in three Ds. Apart from God, we are dead, devilish, and doomed. Um, look at verse one with me. And you were dead, that's blunt, 
and the trespasses and sins, so there's the sphere of our deadness, in which you once walked. Now, what does Paul mean that we're dead? He's not talking primarily about, um, you know, this life of deadness that we live physically, which is to say we're all on our way to dying. We're all dying, right? That's not what he means. We know because he says, you know, in which you once walked. So he's talking about, in other words, a kind of living death, a way of living. And he's saying that the sphere of our deadness is our trespasses and our sins. And we don't have to parse those out. You know, what's the difference? Those terms are often used synonymously in the New Testament. The point is the comprehensiveness of it. We offend God knowingly. We offend God unknowingly. We do things we know we ought not to do, and we don't do things that we ought to know to do. And we're stuck in that mode of being. That's the point. Now, someone will object, of course, and they'll say, you know, that I'm basically a moral person who does good things. But let's notice first that Paul doesn't locate our morality merely in what we're doing, but in the total package of who we are. Look at verse 3. Among whom we all once lived in what? Our passions. You know, the things we really want to do. You hear that word used a lot today. The passions of our flesh, the things that, you know, tend to feel good to us. Carrying out the desires, he's locating it down into the heart of the body and of the mind, even the way that we think is involved in this. And as if that's not enough, we were by nature children of wrath. In other words, it's just who we are. Um, this isn't a perfect demonstration of that point, but about 4,500 people a year, I looked it up today, uh, in the United States are bitten by snakes while handling them. Do you know why that happens? Because they're snakes. And because you're handling them. <laughs> this doesn't pertain, I just find it fascinating that 28% of those people were also intoxicated. Make of that what you will. <laughs> Snakes bite. It's in their nature. But we have a nature too. And we see it most clearly, not in the fact that we do bad things, though we all do, but mainly in the fact that even in our good things, our desires are self-centered. That's why the text doesn't say, among whom we all once lived in our passion for God, carrying out the desires of our heart for his glory. Apart from God, even the good we do, we do with wrong desires because our passions and our desires are dead to God. They're not just sort of flickering on and off. On the way here this morning, I got behind an ambulance. It was early this morning. And I could see through the window, the back window of the ambulance. And uh, th the guy in there was giving CPR to someone. It was really obvious and intense. And, you know, we might think, well, you know, that's how we are. No. We're not in an ambulance receiving CPR. We're in a hearse, flatlined. We have no Godward affections. Even the desires in us to you know, know God are themselves a kind of desire for mastery over God, apart from a miracle, a resurrection on the inside. And in so being, Paul says, we're not only offending God, we are following the prince of the power of the air, which is none other, that's code language for the devil himself. Air here doesn't mean like oxygen. Um, air here refers to the unseen spiritual dimension of reality. In other words, the apostle Paul is saying, by nature, we're not only dead to God, we actually share the same interest as the devil, which is to say self-glorification. I mean, it's like showing up to some kind of a seminar and, you know, looking down the pew and noticing that the devil himself is sitting there and thinking to yourself, what does it say about me that I have the same interest as the devil? He doesn't mean when he says the spirit of, um, that's at work in the sons of disobedience, he doesn't mean that everyone who's a Christian is possessed by the devil. He means that the same 
um, you know, sort of inner desire and logic that's at work in the devil is at work in us from birth. Now, some of us became Christians so long ago that we can barely even, um, you know, remember when it happened. But, you know, any of us who have raised children know that you don't have to teach your children how to be self-centered. I remember hearing uh, Paul Tripp, who uh, has a lot of great things to say about uh, parenting children for the glory of God. If you don't know Paul Tripp, you should check him out. Um, I, he was here with us four or five years ago, maybe longer. And I remember him saying uh, to a group of us, you know, when your kid's three years old, I think, that's, I think he said three years old, basically your job is to help them learn that they are not the center of the universe. Right, I can attest to that now four times. Why? Because we are hardwired to be or to feel as if we are the center of the universe. Nobody has to teach us that. That's who we are. And, you know, unless we're tempted to think, well, that's different because I was born into a Christian home, that's one reason the Apostle Paul changes the, the pronoun here. Look, look here at the middle of the passage with me. Among whom we all all right, so before he said you, and we might be tempted to think that the Apostle Paul puts himself into a different category than the people that he's talking to. I mean, he's Paul. He's a Pharisee of Pharisees. If you don't know the backstory, he was a very religious person before he became uh, a follower of Jesus. And so we might be thinking, you know, he's talking to these pagan Gentiles. He's talking about the culture they grew up in. And then he flips it on us. And he says, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, etc." Why does he do that? Because he wants us to know that even the apostle Paul, who says to us that he he kept the law of God meticulously and zealously. Even the Apostle Paul can say, I too once lived in the passions of my flesh, carrying out the desires of my body because we are born with a sin nature, a bent towards self-glorification, even if we're born into a biblically rich environment. Maybe even especially if. We don't go wrong so much as we go wrong in our religion. We use godly morals to glorify ourselves as easily or maybe even easier than we use ungodly morals. For instance, Luke chapter 18. This was a constant theme in Jesus' preaching. Luke chapter 18. Jesus told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. A Pharisee, like Paul. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Because whoever exalts himself will be humbled, but whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus was constantly emphasizing this point. Two people doing the same religious thing, but the results are entirely opposite. Why? Because of their passions and their desires. Because what was happening on the inside. When we come to God with, you know, the reasons that he should bless us and, and look favorably upon us, our achievements, we're saying in essence, God, look at me, how worthy I am to receive your praise. Treat me like a peer, because I am. I'm like you. And Paul is saying that that's not only dead, it's devilish. And let me be the first to admit that my best deeds need to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's something to be repented of in the best sermon I've ever preached. 
because I'm a self-glorifier by nature. If I trace out my thoughts honestly, if I ask myself, why do I want to write this book or achieve this goal or do this good work, I can always find a part in me, however small, that wants to be admired by you or to gain some kind of leverage over God by my obedience. So I have to keep repenting, turning to God for mercy. The, the old nature, even though I've been made alive with Christ, the old nature is there. It's like Martin Luther used to say, the old man is dead, but he's slow at dying. There's something new there, but the old nature is there. And friends, it's just the same for all of us who've put our faith in Christ, even our repentance needs to be repented of because no sooner have we turned to God than we begin to say, hey, look at us turning to God. You know, he should really bless us for that obedience. And against that devilish, ingratiating, mercenary repentance, we have to turn to God again and receive grace for self-righteousness because without him, we are dead in our sins and trespasses. We are children of, li of wrath like the rest. The, the Greek text doesn't even add of mankind. It's like just a, he's just throwing it out there. We're children of wrath like everybody else. Dead, devilish, doomed people. We should all get what we deserve. Wrath. That's how the story should end. And it's not owing to anything in us that it doesn't end that way. And here enters the most wonderfully abrupt phrase in the whole Bible. But God. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. When? When we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Now, verses 3 and 4 hold together two things that we tend to want to separate, which is to say the wrath of God against sinners and the love of God for sinners. But the Apostle Paul puts them right next to one another. And how could it be otherwise? If God were not angry with sin, then he would not be a just God. But if God, how could he be a God of love if he weren't just? We all know this to be true. Uh, some of my black friends have helped me to see this. Um, they've loved me enough to level with me. Black people have, I mean, I'm saying something so obvious. Black people have suffered a disproportionate amount of injustice in this country. And if that fact alone does not awaken in me some kind of indignation on their behalf, on the behalf of black people, that's the first proof that I don't really love my black neighbors. Because we all know that love seeks justice for the beloved. And God seeks justice too. In two places. There are only two ways that God punishes human evil. Either in us or in Christ. The wrath of God against sinners falls with finality in two places. At the cross of Christ upon his own son or upon us at the return of Christ. Now, that might sound as if I'm putting the wrath of God on par with the mercy of God, but I'm not doing that because the text isn't doing that. Look with me there at verse four. But God being rich in mercy, Notice the text does not say, but God, who is rich in wrath, had mercy. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love. So here's the mercy flowing out of us. What's the mercy flowing from? It's flowing from the great love of God. Love is foundational. It's why the Bible doesn't say God is wrath. It says God is love. God has wrath because he is love. The great mercy of God is flowing out to us richly 
And it's doing that because what is deepest in God, God's heart the, is the love of God. The love of God is so foundational to his being that his love even makes a way of satisfying his wrath. We see the word wrath and it's sort of magnified in our eyes, but that's not what God's magnifying. He calls his grace great. He calls his love great. He calls his mercy rich. We are by nature children of wrath. He is by nature loving and therefore merciful. Mercy is deeper in his heart than wrath. We drove him to wrath and he responds by drawing us through love with mercy. That's who he is. That's the universe that we have parachuted into. Made us alive together with Christ. That's how he did it. The life-giving power of God for dead sinners flows into this world in only one place, at the cross. And that's the only way out of the feedback loop of self-glorification. The only way to really turn to God from sin is to fall on our faces at the cross and cry out to God, have mercy on me, I'm a sinner. And you can't do that unless you know that you're not just, you know, sort of receiving CPR, needing, you know, a heart surgery. You are dead. And apart from God, you have no life. Jesus went to bat for us at the cross. That's what happened. Recently, my, uh, one of my daughters, we were talking before bed, and uh, we were talking about atonement, the fact that God punishes Jesus for the things that we should be punished for. And she said to me very discerning questions. She said, yeah, but Dad, did Jesus want that to happen? And I said, yeah, baby. He feels good about it. And isn't that question inside of all of our hearts? I mean, okay, so God forgives. But how does he feel about it? And that's why the Apostle Paul goes out of his way to emphasize this point. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. Why? Because you're a diamond in the rough and he could see your potential? No. <laughs> what are his reasons? He's rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Every reason God needs to love you is in him. He loves you into lovability. So that at any point when you're thinking to yourself, and who hasn't thought this? I'm basically disgusting. Look at me. I don't even like me. Okay. Because of the great love with which he loved us. He made us alive together with Christ. Because of who he is. The Bible is not merely saying to us in the words of John Duncan, you know, Jesus, there is a great savior out there somewhere. The Bible is saying to us, how dare you go to hell? You have to tread on the cross of Christ to get there. Because of the great love with which he loved us, he gave his son. How dare we not receive him? How dare we, how dare we feel unlovable? His great love. It's as if, you know, we tend to think it's, it's, like, it's the wrath of God sort of beating against our barricade, trying to get through to us, telling us we're sinners, but it's the great love of God that we can't believe. That's where we need his grace. God loves you. I hope you feel those words. He not only loves you, he loved, past tense, you. In Christ. Now what's the point in emphasizing this? Comfort, security, the exhale of grace, 
a good nap. Forgiveness. Felt forgiveness. So as we go now to prepare our hearts for Holy Communion, we do so in the knowledge that we're not beating God's door down for our forgiveness. God is moving toward us with his grace, enlivening us at the very time that we are his enemies. He wants us to feel forgiven. He feels good about it. So let's prepare our hearts now to receive Holy Communion. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that we are holding your word in our hands because you are moving toward us, that all of the energy and all of the movement in this relationship is, begins with you, and we look now to your enlivening grace, and we pray, Father, that you would comfort us and restore us and revive us and re-energize us by your grace, totally one-sided, uh, maybe for the first time, but again for many of us. And Father, I pray that everyone here would float out of church today feeling how rich in mercy and great in love you are toward them in particular. And Father, I pray especially for that one who feels as if they've gone beyond the pale of your grace. Show them now how much more worthy the blood of Christ is, how much more generous a payment it is for sin than any sin they could commit. In the holy name of Christ we pray. Amen.